Agent Carter, Season 2, Episode 1, Thoughts. This episode is called The Lady in the Lake. Another episode I love, spoilers for everything MCU leading up to and including this episode, but not for anything MCU that came out after this episode first premiered. And let's dive right in. So, yeah, I quite like the... They, they invert this, this image. In, in season one, we see Peggy, and they, they put it in, in the, what's it called, the, um, the previously on. You know, Peggy is, is this, you know, has, has the, um, the blue and red in this sea of, of gray, and she's also the only woman, but she's walking with, all these men walking to work. She's going to work as well. And here, we see someone who is wearing that same thing, going in the opposite direction. And it is revealed to be Dottie. When she gets into the bank, Dottie is not going to an honest day of work. So very nicely done there. And, yeah, you know, would you like to... Uh, what was it? D uh, deposit or withdrawal? Withdrawal. <laughs> I don't... That's been used in so many, like, scenes in movies and TV shows where that's, like, the line that leads into a bank robbery. Somehow it never gets old. It's always such a fun play on... Well, not play on words, but yeah, cleverness. And the SSR knew and managed... To stop it, and I think at this point, Peggy should probably stop pointing guns at Dottie, because it invariably leads to a fight scene. I'm not complaining, I'm just saying I don't think Peggy is the biggest fan <clears throat> of these fights, but yeah, very cool fight. You know, they... They knew what we wanted more of, you know. They they deliberately didn't kill off Dottie at the end of season one, even though she got thrown out of a window. Now, I'm not saying that she wouldn't, she couldn't have lived in the MCU, yeah. But yeah, um, the the yeah, obviously we wanted to see a rematch between the two of them. At one point, Dottie like roars, just she's such a badass, and yeah, they do manage to. To catch her, I, I like the the use of like the interior, you know, these these um, valuables inside a bank as as weapons. Very Spider-Man too. I, I see what you did there, and I applaud it. And yeah, we are now in 1947, and um, some of the SSR has gone to L.A including Sousa. And, yeah, I will say, when I learned that... <clears throat> that apparently this season is about tracking down a serial killer, like, I... Yeah, I see how... Like, apparently, you know, some people in reviews said that they really felt like this season felt like out of place compared to the the first one yeah um but with the added the the sci-fi element sci-fi twist to it i'm seeing how it it fits and yeah very cool interrogation and <laughs> yeah i quite like you know the the um, we have this exchange where <clears throat> you know uh, yeah Peggy just makes demands and you know Dottie is like you you girls who were given everything you know you think that everything will come easily to you and then Peggy responds girls like you who were handcuffed to the bed, the only thing you understand is violence or threats, you know, so, yeah. And 
I will say that Thompson sending Peggy to LA when she's just about to like she's doing she is probably their best bet at getting answers out of Dottie that felt weird like the end of season one showed that he respects her more now and she you know <clears throat> the fact that they're both at the bank stopping Dottie you know maybe she was the one who convinced him to do that maybe he thought of the probably not but maybe he at least thinks he thought of the of, of that mission but she is there, you know, he didn't say, you should stay and man the phones, you know, so it feels very odd, and I mean, just to have it be one of the FBI people putting pressure on, like, later in the episode, the FBI come in and take over Dottie, just have it be one of them getting rid of, of Peggy, you know, it does. It really doesn't make sense for it to be Thompson, It's it's very much like the writers just maneuvering pieces into place you know they want Peggy in or just like have it be that she goes before they before they caught Dottie does that make sense yeah I, I don't know but it's, 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 no I think what makes the most sense is for the FBI to be putting pressure to to get her out of there you know maybe maybe say something about you know oh the the mayor's breathing down my neck etc etc she did technically commit treason. You know, she trusted someone who was accused of treason, then she committed treason, it worked out, but there are people who want her in prison. You know, if we get her to L.A., get her, you know, out of sight, out of mind, that's gonna, you know, that's, that's the best way to protect her. Just have something like that instead of this. You know, she even makes some counter-arguments that he just ignores. Is it the Flamingo? It's the Flamingo. I am not the biggest fan of adding a cute animal sidekick in a sequel to, to you know, desperately try to drum up interest. And I, I'm aware the show, you know, it only ended up lasting two seasons and both seasons struggled in the ratings. You know, that's why, you know, essentially, I'm sure the people working on it would have loved for it to go seven seasons like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. ended up doing. But that one did better in the ratings. And, yeah, this, I, I really hope that the Flamingo does not play a big role in the rest of this season. Ultimately, it was more, it's it's not huge in this episode. It was more that the moment I saw it, I felt like, you know, I got a sinking feeling in my stomach. I was like, oh god, please don't do this. Hopefully they they won't. Like, I appreciate it. it is kind of funny that you know Jarvis is driving around this this flamingo, but it just it feels like pushing it too far. You know, there was already some great you know, not like uproarious laughter comedy, but like little little bits of like there's it's amusing that he's this butler and he's going on spy missions you know in season one hopefully also this it will also so far a little this, this season at least as much as they've been able to this season i'm hoping they'll they'll stick to that because that i think really works and yeah uh jarvis rants about these young people wasting all their money on avocado toast and in general a bunch of Los Angeles uh, criticisms from a New York person it is very amusing to get that in this kind of Hollywood production like it's yeah you know um, the people writing this are you know yeah Hollywood people so they're essentially you know making fun of or at least echoing criticisms that you know other I can imagine it, it's maybe like they were taking notes whenever someone from for example New York from another big city visited them in LA and yeah 
you know, complained about various things. And yeah, so we have yet another joke on the show about like someone trying to make it big in show business and failing. Um, yeah, still not. Yeah, I, again, it's it's very it's very. There's a lot of Hollywood productions that have that kind of joke. You know, you make you make jokes about. I'm I'm not saying it's some sinister thing. You know, you make jokes about what you know. That's that's fairly common. You know. Yeah, I I don't know. I'm not the biggest fan. I I think it's funnier when they're like making fun of powerful people because people who audition you know as as they're leaving they're even like this is the third time this week so it's like come on give them a break you know I'm, I'm not like I get why they don't get a break here because this is a cover operation and you know there's a there's you know they're making a joke the show's making a joke about you know <clears throat> people who are so desperate to make it in Hollywood they somehow find even the most, you know, out of place, you know, the name is misprinted, all this stuff, you know, they still find their way there to, to audition. It just feels like kicking down to me, you know, it doesn't feel like they're, you know, the, um, uh, Jessica, Jessica Jones did some, some jokes about, like, show business, and that felt much more like it had sympathy and empathy for the people who work really hard to try to make it and are abused by the system now let me have the yeah very cool with the secret entrance the s and r like ssr eh, cute and yeah um very awkward when Peggy and Sousa meet back up. <clears throat> you know, Thompson lied to her, saying that Sousa asked for her specifically. And, you know, yeah, she called, she left messages, he never responded, and he said sometimes a three-hour difference feels like a lifetime. And at the end of the episode, we see that he is with someone, so that might be why. You know, he didn't want his new partner to, to think that he was still hung up on Peggy, which, you know, there's some chance, some, some, some of us cis straight men are terrible at, like, not bringing up, you know, like, try to put yourself in your partner's shoes, or your, your date's shoes, or what, you know, it is not the most wonderful thing to hear in the world that you are personally still super into someone that isn't them, you know, like, save that kind of stuff for them, tell you know, if, if your relationship is at a stage where that's okay, you know. Anyway. <clears throat> yeah, so the they they finally managed to, to thaw up the the body, but she's still frozen through and she glows in the dark, which immediately makes all the eight year olds watching deeply jealous of her. Seriously though, that that is a very cool. You know, that's when I knew. Okay, this season still has, you know, um, yeah, that's legitimately very a, a very cool, interesting, uh, yeah. And we have the, you know, I think, yeah, I think by this point in the episode they had, you know, the, there was that line about, do we know if the the lake froze her or vice versa? Which is a, yeah, because, like, they mentioned, you know, it's, how how is this lake frozen over? How, uh, you know, or th this part of the lake, you know, and, and, yeah, maybe it's not the lake being cold. Maybe her body is freezing stuff. <clears throat> and the short answer is no. 
The long answer. That's also the long answer. <laughs> and yeah, apparently the lab doctor feels very overlooked. He no nobody ever invites him along when they go drinking. And Sousa didn't even know his name, so it's there might be something to that. And Right, I love the cut between, you know, Peggy asks something like, you know, is what is anodyne, what was it, isodyne, uh, you know, smash cut, and the isodyne receptionist is answering that exact question, you know, it's very, very nicely, you know, because there's, there's no reason, you know, like, what happened in between the, the cut? is obviously that Haley, you know, uh, Peggy, wow, my, my brain is fried. Um, you'd think I hadn't gotten enough sleep, but this is actually, it was the night of yesterday where I didn't get enough sleep. I thought that was going to wreck my videos, but I actually think I did fairly well. Last night, I, I really caught up on sleep, and now I've, my brain is a fried egg. But yeah, the, the uh, yeah. You know, obviously, Peggy, you know, yeah, asks that question. They find the, the address. They get in the car. They drive there, walk up to the receptionist. There's no reason, there's no reason, no need to show us that. You know, it's the, once the question has been asked, we can go straight to the answer. <clears throat> I love when a, a TV show or movie just doesn't waste the audience's time at all, just gets immediately to the point. And, yeah, I like how she keeps saying, anything else I can help you with? You know, just the, the several questions that they can't get a clear answer to. And, you know, I th I th yeah, she says something like, do you have a warrant? You know, anything else I can help you with? And apparently she is... Sweet on Sousa, who is charming, you know, it's, yeah, and, see, yeah, and she, you know, yeah, she's like, well, you know, I just need to get a, a, an access card from one of the, one of the people who has one, you know, friends uh, need the bathroom, and then bumps into the guy, and, you know, makes, like, a, a positive reference to his appearance, so he doesn't, you know, think twice, but, you know, and, and that is the thing, like, if, if someone bumps into you, you might be really frustrated, unless you find them attractive, you know, that's, and she gets in there, and <laughs> how would you like to have, what, what was it, to, to be thunderstruck or something like that? <clears throat> and you know he he squeezes out some some drops from that. Then anybody else notice that it just keeps like he lets the thing just keep dripping after that. So I guess I guess he really wanted to fill that glass. But yeah, you know, taste this. Are you trying to poison me? Well, it's ethanol, so yeah. <laughs> Love when someone's honest about the fact that alcohol is technically poison. And, like, I'm just saying, hypothetically, imagine that alcohol didn't exist. And someone just told you, I have this great new thing. Everyone's going to love it. This is just, people are not going to be able to get enough of this. I want to poison people. Like, you lock him up, you know. That, that wouldn't be, like, you know, oh, this is, yeah. And, and that, like, yeah, moving on. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so, um, Wilkes immediately recognizes, uh, you know, ah, uh, crap. Her name does not appear to be in the, ah, uh, J.S. I remember her initials were J.S. <clears throat> and... Yeah, the, the, you know, he's, he's, 
obsessed and he upset and he wants to find out what uh, what happened here and you know she gets a lot of information out of him and he's like oh well you know um she had a special relationship with you know this this guy who might become senator they were close they were sleeping together <laughs> you know and she's like okay point made and he's like are you sure because I have some details about preferred positions. Let's see. And yeah. <laughs> the receptionist catches her in there. And yeah, Wilkes gives her give yeah, gives her the the car Peggy the card and his personal number. And then ask for her number, so he's very forward. And yeah, they're going to go to the the horse race, and we meet Anna Jarvis. And yeah, um, she's not wrong. We were all expecting, you know, we 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 hadn't seen her before this episode, but she's been referenced many times across season one. And yeah, we did kind of expect her to be like a female Jarvis, uh, Edwin, you know, and uh, let's see, she's got like a Hungarian accent, which I think, let's see, I believe that was what, because he said that he was saving, you know, he was saving this young Jewish woman, and yeah, you know, I forget exactly, let's see, was, was Hungary, was that... Like, was that taken by the Nazis or under threat? And maybe she fled before. Uh, yeah, some something like that, you know. <clears throat> um, and yeah, we again, ag again, the the sequel thing of trying to make it, you know, bigger and and get, you know, um, the the Jarvis's kiss right in front of Peggy, and it's just like. Would Edwin really... The Edwin of season one probably wouldn't have been comfortable with with it. Like, just have him tell Peggy, you know, can you can you wait a second outside? Or or for the two of them to walk off somewhere. It just... Yeah, it, it felt very, very forced in. And Anna says, you know, based on what Edwin said... The, the, you know, I was expecting a circus strongman in a wig, which, <sighs> really not a fan of the, of the transphobia there. <clears throat> see. Like, you know, you, you could make, like, have her say, you know, I, I thought you would look exactly like, crap, I forget what it was called, let's see. Um, there's that old poster called We Can Do It. Ah. Uh, Rosie the Riveter. You know, I thought you'd look like Rosie the Riveter. You know, the. Yeah, if you don't have a mental image, uh, you know, yeah, Google We Can Do It. You'll get the picture, literally. Uh, you know, have, have something like that, you know. That wouldn't be transphobic at all. And um, let me have the yeah. I I like um, Peggy charm. You know, being very charming to Calvin Chadwick, CC, but not Babcock. And then she's like, you know, I was um, I was talking to you just recently with my friend JS. You know, and yeah, he really does not want to. To talk about her, and I like that you know to to distract the the Calvin's you know partner Jarvis you know claims oh I've got a movie role for you and then he's like ah right so you know he clearly didn't think it through yet and then he's like basically trying to pitch like a movie about Peggy Carter which I'm down for you know. Uh, the bridges are coming. It's a it's a spy movie. 
I don't think there would be a love interest. No, we haven't been able to find the right person. You know, just yeah, very nicely done there. And yeah, they see that the the uh, coroner was frozen and shatters. Very very cool. And yeah, no wonder that Edwin needs to to go outside. That's yeah. <coughs> And yeah, um, Thompson brings up the the carrot and the stick routine, and then implies, you know, there's gonna be no carrot this time because you and your commie buddies killed the the carrot. And I think yeah, and I think that's when you know. So so yeah, he he uncuffs her. He's like, I'm not afraid of you. And she like knocks over the table, so like it's like starting to choke him. And and just yeah, such a badass. And it's very clear, like she didn't think that this would be her escaping. She just she's doing because she immediately, like, yeah, you know, the there's like guns trained on her like two seconds after she knocks over the table. And she, you know, she comfortably just you know, surrenders, like, take me, take me in, officer, you know, it's perfectly fine. She's just making clear, you know, I am not the one you F with. And, let's see, yeah, and <clears throat> the, the cop who'd been on the, the case for, for two years, you know, tells Dr. Wilkes, uh, fix me. And I, I like the thing, you know, Wilkes is trying to warn Edwin, like, he's going to punch you in the face. I told you he was going to punch you in the face. And we have the, uh, let's see. Yeah, and the, yeah, he gets a bit away and he's, he's explaining, you know, I didn't do this, but some people ask me to do things like this and I, I help for money, you know. And let's see. Yeah, and and the you know you have Kurt Woodsmith. Love seeing him in something again. Um, you know, yeah, he's he takes over Dottie, and then he tells Thompson. You know, the you're 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 going the way of the dinosaur, and Thompson is like, I'm gonna get a very funny, clever sitcom that tackles relevant issues. Unfortunately, that's not what was that that was not the intended meaning, and. <clears throat> Yeah, the, the, you know, Carter keeps telling them not to shoot. One guy does shoot the the cop and claims, you know, I'm sorry, my, my radio was in the, I left my radio in the car. And then later he's, you know, dealing directly with Calvin and being told, you know, good job. And apparently it wasn't Calvin who was behind, yeah, it was actually his, his partner. And we close the episode on the on on Doctor Wilkes looking at the the sloshing material, which yeah, that's almost definitely what caused the the freezing. It seems like he knows something that he's not telling Peggy, and yeah, very interested to see where this goes. This was a very solid overall. I had a couple of issues you know, season opener, and, let's see, yeah, so some <clears throat> IMDb trivia for this episode, when Peggy arrives at the SSR LA office, there's a sign in the background with the words, Tales of Suspense, a title of the Marvel comic that first introduced Iron Man. There really was an early 20th century particle physicist named Chadwick. He was awarded a Nobel Prize in 1935 for the discovery of the neutron, later led the British team that worked on the Manhattan Project. 
However, the Calvin Chadwick character in this series does not actually work as a scientist. Isodyne Energy is instead the company's owner, more interested in his political ambitions. And in the comics, Whitney Frost is the alias of Giulietta Nefari, also known as the Iron Man villainess, Madame Mask. The bank heist that opens the show was filmed in an old Bank of America on Spring Street in downtown L.A. Because its vault had been converted into a bar, the vault seen on screen was constructed on a soundstage. After it was scrapped, it was decided that the sequence needed a few more scenes to make it really sizzle, so the set had to be constructed a second time a month after its original use. And... Let's see... Oh, right, yeah. In in this episode, they talk about, you know, oh, Howard Stark is making movies. Howard Hughes, a brilliant engineer, contemporary of the fictional Howard Stark, also produced and directed movies in the early 20th century. So, yeah, very neat. And Jarvis picks up Peggy from the airport in a vintage convertible 1938 Packard Super 8. Right, I, I like that uh, Anna made a you know, a, um, a holster for for Peggy that, what does she say it also? Yeah, something. My brain is melting out my, my ears. So I'm just going to finish the video real quick. Um, the masks used by the hazmat team are M9 field protective masks, which at the time of the show were a new piece of equipment designed to withstand cold better than previous U.S. masks. So that's, that's a neat little, yeah, you know, against the cold. <clears throat> and let's see. I think that might be about. <clears throat> Um, yes, so I I am going to try to do an episode tomorrow, and yeah, in closing the, the exchange between Peggy and Edwin, that is Calvin Chadwick, oh, and his wife, Whitney Frost, who? Whitney Frost, star of the F stands for freedom? This doesn't look familiar. Well, surely you've seen Tales of Suspense. I'm not one for the cinema. What do you do for the relaxation? Assemble rifles.